that he was put in is a place where he is being nurtured in love, where he is being um, taught by love because Yahuwah is love. So then he, Adam, who is from Yahuwah, can be love, right? So this place is a place of learning, training, and preparation for what Yahuwah is getting him to do getting ready getting him ready to do and so I, we're talking about mercy and truth but for now we understand that that is going to be personified in the person of adam and the recipient of that which is the woman um we're going to see how that's a beautiful love um, serve and return right it's that interaction and so every time I'm referring to Adam and the woman, think of it as um, your spirit and our soul, right? So last Friday, we talked about how they were like children in the garden. And, um, you know, their Abba father is true to everything that he says. So he was, you know, nurturing them um, and he was teaching them so that, Though they don't uh, depart from his teaching when they grow old, in a sense, right? And we talked about how, you know, there's several scriptures that talks about how we're to have a childlike faith in order for us to be in the kingdom. So today we're going to talk about uh, the Genesis 2 account. And why don't I go there and just uh, read it? Okay, so we're going to park in... Um, Okay, so verse 17. Actually, no, I'm jumping the gun here. So let's park, let's start in verse 8. So Yahuwah planted a garden eastward in Eden, and then he put man, the man whom he had formed there. And out of the ground, Yahuwah Elohim made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life, was also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Thank you. Huh? Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, okay, so my question is, and I think you saw this in the email, is that the traditional view is that there are two trees in the garden. Okay. So what I'm going to propose to you today is that potentially there's really only a single tree. But why does it seem like there is another tree? So, and this sort of goes along with what we've been talking about, Sister Donna, where Yahuwah only spoke once, but we hear this twice. So Yahuwah calls us to be in Ikad with him. Or if you want to use, you know, you've used, you've heard the term dual, duality. We are in a duality. Yahuwah doesn't call us to live in the duality of nature because he wants us to choose the tree of life, right? So the tree of life, okay, sorry. So here we have to recognize that it, this is in English, 
Um, and what's interesting about this is if you break it down into Hebrew, it, it becomes extremely different. So the tree of life was also in the midst. So the key here is the midst of the garden. So just keep that in mind. And the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It says end. But if you look at the Hebrew here, um, it will basically say that, um, here we go, the tree of life is in the midst. So etz is the tree, kai is life, the tavek is the center, the, the midst of it, of the garden. And then it doesn't really, here in the in English, you see the word and the tree. But in Hebrew, you don't really see that. What makes us um, think that it's not this second reference to the word tree is referring to the same tree, right? So, and okay, so point being is, is it possible that it's just one tree? And that's just a question that I'm throwing out there right now. But this particular uh, reference to the tree, all of a sudden we see that there's knowledge of good and evil, okay? So as far as um, the viewpoint of the tree, is there an overcomer viewpoint is my question. So we've talked about um, in, let me see, huh? so is there an overcomer viewpoint? And what I've noted down here is there's about at least three, um, and you're more than welcome to add to the list, but I'm finding three, and you're going to find that I'll talk and refer to uh, three, the number three a lot, right? So what's the overcomer viewpoint? And then I'll talk about that, and we're going to go back to the story so we can start to sort sorry walk through it in this from this viewpoint right so the tree of life um we know from genesis 3 22 that it really it really is um it represents spirituality or immortality because in genesis 3 22 um yahuwah elohim said and if you focus on the latter of that verse it says if, if they take from the tree of life and eat, they will live forever. So there's the tree of life has something to do with immortality. The tree of knowledge of good and evil um, has something to do with divinity, being a divine being, or what's another word for a divinity? Ruler, okay? What's another known word for ruler? Godlike, right? So Yahuwah, and where do, you, where do you get that from? Yahuwah Elohim said, behold, the man is become like one of us. That's Yahuwah talking to know good and evil. So based on that, I, I, I take that based on that, there, there isn't really something wrong with partaking from that tree of knowledge of good and evil. And we're going to try to unpack as to why it became such a... Um, a, a, a big deal it, to a point where it changed, it shifted the, the history of man in a sense, right? So the tree of life, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, we look at it from that perspective, spirituality or divinity, right? And from the looks of it is Yahuwah um, first wanting Eve to take from the spirituality, from the immortality before divinity can be established. That's sort of what where, where I'm coming from. So the second viewpoint, Shalom, Brother James, thanks for joining. So the second viewpoint is that the tree of life represents sonship, okay? And what does sonship, what does sonship have to do with, um, with anything? What's the difference between sonship and child? There is, right? So we're talking um, Isaiah 9, 6, and this is speaking of Yah Yahusha. Isaiah 9, 6 says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The, the scripture isn't saying those things just for fun. There's, there's, there's a difference between a child and a son, right? And we get a clue of that from, uh, from Paul's writing in Galatians 4. 
because he says now I say that the heir so heir is someone who is in line to inherit right so we're talking about inheritance here so as long as he's a child you don't differ from a slave you know even though you're a master of all but as a child you're under guardians and stewards until an appointed time so even so when we were children we were in bondage under the elements of the world that's an interesting point that paul is making but when the fullness of the time had come yahuwah sent forth his son born of a woman born under law to redeem those who are under the law that we might receive the adoption as sons and then once we reach that level of sonship then we have this ability to cry out abba father and then by that and and take note of prior to that it says yahuwah has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts so there's there's this um it's the yahusha by the spirit of yahuwah indwelling or dwelling our hearts richly in a sense and we have this such intimacy when we're calling abba father right you got to see it like that and then after that it says therefore you're no longer a slave but a son and if a son and if a son then an heir of yahuwah through mashiach so what's the difference so um the difference is uh, a child is one that has an inheritance allocated or reserved for him and you know the scripture says we've been given everything pertaining to life and godliness everything now sonship on the other hand is actually saying yes to that inheritance and taking possession of it walking in authority and so it's not just a gift that's sitting in the shelf right if somebody gives you a gift um it's great but if i don't use the gift you know it, it's that's the difference it's the power it's the authority and we can see that here in isaiah 9 6 because you know yahusha was given to us he was born a child in a sense like he, like man like he became like us like a man right and unto us unto us a son is given so the sonship then talks about how the government will be upon his shoulder and his name will be called wonderful counselor mighty yah everlasting father you see that the that is who yahusha is right and it's it's in the sonship right that and as you can see counselor that requires discernment and and, and stuff like that right so um so the difference between a child and sonship as far as the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil is that the the tree of knowledge is is like a, it represents being a child okay so you're in position you are there in the garden you've been given everything pertaining to life and godliness but then there is a part that needs to progress all the way to the tree of life because the tree of life will now represent sonship okay and um what's interesting in the galatians account that we just read is that the guardians you see how verse 2 says but is under guardians and steward so a child is under guardians and steward guardian in um in greek means you know epitropos or and at one to whose care or honor anything has been instructed a guardian a manager an overseer so a guardian you know that sounds like a, a heavenly angel or a, a heavenly body right and then stored in greek is oikos or an inhabited house the house of yah the tabernacle tents and huts so it it kind of sounds like the garden too so adam and eve were in the garden Remember, we, we're, we're, we're saying that they're there as children and they're being trained, they're being equipped for something. So, and, and we see this in the account of 1 Samuel 3. And Sister Donna and I, we were talking about this earlier, how um, Eli refers to Samuel as a servant and child. And, and if you remember the story of Samuel um, in chapter 3, where 
they're both asleep and um, Samuel hears Yahuwah calling his name. But then Samuel perceives it as Eli. And then three, the third time later, you know, um, Eli now tells Samuel, you know, the, the, next, the next time you hear the call, answer him, here I am, speak, Yahuwah, your servant hears, something like that, right? And then when that, when that took place, then the office of uh, Samuel was basically established. So you got to read the account to see that yourself. But what's interesting is after that, the third time, um, Eli doesn't refer to Samuel as a child or a servant or a boy. He refers to Samuel as my son, my son, right? So look into that, um, check it out for yourself. But what is, what makes the transition from being a child to sonship is the word of Yahuwah. The nashama, the breath of Yah is what brings sonship, right? Um, so going back to the story of Samuel, um, remember Samuel was in um, serving. He was in ministry at the, in the temple. And, but yet, when Yahuwah was calling him the first time, he didn't really perceive Yahuwah's voice. He perceived it as Eli. And the scripture says that that's because um, he didn't know Yahuwah yet, and the word of Yah wasn't revealed to him yet, right? So what does the word of Yah do? The word of Yah is what brings the Torah to life. It, it's what um, solidifies you know, it's what makes us, the righteousness of Yahuwah, being um, taught to us through the Torah and the law of Yahuwah, becoming alive in us. So, you know, so the law, the, the, the law or the Torah by itself, without the breath of Yah, in the person of Yahusha, dwelling richly in our hearts is just a head knowledge and can be a worldly wisdom. But head knowledge making it one or incongruent with the heart of our understanding is godly wisdom. So do we see another uh, reference in scripture that supports what I just said? Um, if you look at Jeremiah 8.8, 8, we see that there is a reference to a worldly wisdom and there's a reference to the wisdom of Yah. You can inject that, right? Jeremiah 8.8 8 says, how can you say we are wise? And the law of Yahuwah is with us. So that's talking about the Torah. How can you say you're wise and the law of Yahuwah is with us? Look, the false pen of the scribe certainly works falsehood. So in other words, the, the law of Yahuwah, right, depending on who is, um, who is the guardian of it or is teaching you just like Eli is supposed to be the guardian of Samuel right he's the priest that was looking after Samuel at the time because Hannah uh, committed Samuel to Eli um could Eli have said when Samuel was responding and thinking that it was a Eli that was calling him could he have misdirected Samuel elsewhere could Eli have said Forget about it. You're not hearing the word of Yah. Just go back to sleep the third time. So in other words, you know, if we are as children, we are being taught the, the law of, of the Torah. Can the teacher, can our understanding of it fall at the wrong hands? And apparently it looks like it did here, right? The, there is a false pen of the scribe that is now turning um, what's truth into falsehood, right? And the scripture goes on, the wise men are ashamed, they are dismayed and taken. Behold, they have rejected the word of Yah. So what wisdom do they have? So in other words, they know the Torah, but they only have a head knowledge of it. They are not making the Torah be one, or they, they haven't had the word of Yahweh come up and be realized within them, right? So we have the breath of Yahweh given to us, which is the word of him, the word of Yahweh, right? And is it possible that 
um, we get um, that we can be tricked into or that we can be misdirected into um, believing a lie, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Okay. So anyway, so that's the, the, the one viewpoint, the overcomer viewpoint of the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The third viewpoint is the tree of life is a picture of the book of covenant. Um, so we know, uh, you know, if you're tracking with Matthew Nolan, if you're familiar with the difference between the book of the covenant and uh, the book of the law, um, there's no curses attached to the book of covenant. But then the book of the law has blessings and curses attached to it, right? So if you want to look at it from this perspective, the tree of life is the perfect will of Yah. And then the tree of knowledge is the good and acceptable will. And that's going to make sense a little bit more later on when we get into the, um, the details of what I'm trying to say. Um, but if you look at amplified classic version, it actually does um, – make a reference to the tree of the knowledge uh, of the difference between good and evil. And then it says blessing and calamity. You see that? Okay. And then, so we see the same thing take place in the, in the Exodus 19 account. You know, Yahuwah came down, descended from the mountain, um, offering the kingdom to the children of Israelites. Right. And we know what happened. They did. Um, they accepted the proposal by faith. Right. So even though they didn't really fully understand what was taking place, they accepted it. They accepted the proposal. But what ended up happening is because the obedience part was lacking. Right. And that's what Yahoo was looking for to um, make them steadfast to the tree of life, like make them to walk out the kingdom of Yah on earth. But then instead of choosing the tree of life, they chose the tree of knowledge of good and evil, right? They, they chose to disobey, and now they're stuck with the book of law, which has the blessings and curses attached to it, right? So then there's, this, this, there's also this idea of the difference between, you know, if you look at the tree of knowledge of good and evil, we have to understand that there is a difference between good and evil and truth and falsehood, right? So um, trust, I mean, truth is, it's objective. You know, you, there's no compromise of that. It's, you're either, it's either true or it's not. Good and evil is a little different because Isaiah 5.20 tells us that even you know, there's a warning, a stark, severe warning to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. So the good and evil, perception-wise, can be twisted, right? And it can be redirected. And I'll, I'll, I'll talk about a small example of that with what's happening today, presently. But... What Yahoo was doing was he was looking to, um, you know, he wants us to reach the level of trust. You know, when, when we're teaching our young ones, like, you know, our children at home, we're teaching them truth, right? And um, so when they leave the house, now it is up to them to practice that, right? So, so what, what was happening in the garden was Yahweh was teaching Adam and Eve, establishing them in truth. But, you know, they're not always going to be in that space, you know, like our, our children will eventually go out into the world and interact with what's happening outside. So now they're going to get tested whether or not they really believed in the truth, whether they would obey the teachings of the parents, right? So tr trust is established in truth. So Yahuwah wants to trust Adam and Eve so that he, so that they would go out there um, steadfast in truth, unmovable. And so with that comes spiritual discernment and creativity, right? So in other words, once you are steadfast in truth, 
you'll be able to discern good and evil much better. And not only that, you're, you're free to express your uniqueness, the, the giftings that Yahuwah has given us. And, you know, and, and that comes with maturity, you know, perfection and completeness, right? And so, um, so I'll, I'll give you an example of what I mean by that. So um, it's, I know Brother James is on the, the line, but like, Brother James is doing his in-depth study of truth and mercy. And he shared, um, you know, his summation of how he connected that with the menorah. And so, Brother James, I can email this to you. Let me know if there needs to be tweaking. But I put this here um, according to how he, um, you know, made the connection. And that is a beautiful creation. That is the the frequency the understanding that he received by studying and paying attention to the word that is his uniqueness that is yahuwah teaching him in a unique way and now he's sharing it with us and it looks look at that and he, you know he can take this and explain that away and see how he came to that conclusion so that's his that's his unique take on it right so for me yahuwah has a different take on how I looked at that and in combination, right, it makes, it brings us to a level of higher understanding or overstanding. So mine, you know, and, and it is one spirit, one mind. It's just expressed in different flavors, if you want to call it like that, right? So what I'm saying is Yahuwah is looking for Adam and Eve to reach maturity first so that they can be trusted and they can have spiritual discernment. And once they go out into the world, they can express the giftings that Yahuwah has given them and they are well guarded. They're going to be able to discern what's good and evil. So what's an example of um, good and evil? If you look at, uh, remember we talked about how the prince of the power of the air, right? And so the power is in the air, not in the prince. So the power is in the creator of the breath. And we know that Yahuwah blew the breath of his nashama into our nostrils. And so that is the power, the authority that's been allotted to us so that we can walk in rulership here on earth. But we also know that that it's possible for the the for that the that truth to be hijacked right so we see in in revelation that the um, you know the anti the beast he was given the authority to breathe the image into these people who rejected yahweh right and so what's an example of that so if you look at for example um, direct weapon energy, project blue beam, harp, all these things, these are um, you know, technology that is harnessing the energy by redirecting it, right? And harnessing the power of the air, you know, blowing it in a different direction that is against us. So, you know, like if you know direct directed energy weapons can be weaponized and it can be used to um you know to 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 do something with our heart like to cause a heart attack project blue beam they can augment reality on a global scale you see how you know for us to be able to tell the difference we have to be in a state of maturity so that we don't fall for these things, so that we know how to, to claim Isaiah 54, where it says, no weapons formed against us shall prosper. But if you say that and you have slight, the slightest doubt and unbelief, it's not that the scripture isn't working. You've just created something to block uh, the authority that you have already been given by Yahweh, right? So, um, in the garden, again, this was a place where Ad, it's a 
it's a place, a safe place for Adam to learn and be nurtured and all that stuff. And, um, you know, Yahuwah even says that to train up a child in the way in the way he should go um, so that when he is old, he will not depart from it. So truly, um, the tree in the garden was being used as a mo modality for learning. Right. So even in the Septuagint. Genesis that in Genesis 2 it, it says that the tree is for the is of the learning of knowledge of good and evil right so we're gonna see that um, and this is just sort of a, a snippet for the future like an outlook in the future we're gonna see that um, the modality of learning is going to be expressed in numbers or in math in music or in the new song or the song of Moshe and language or the ability to call out, to express, to prophesy, to be able to, um, you know, express the gifting of the Ruach HaKodesh in clarity because we have the Shin, the Nashamav, yeah, right? So that's sort of just a future outlook of what this is going to look like um, because once we establish that, you know, there is some learning that's taking place in the garden, now we're going to see how we can apply, um, you know, that the victory, the preparation, and all that in in our spirit, man, in our soul, in our flesh, in our body, right? So, um, so now, so now we know that the, the trees in the garden are are there for learning. Now, let's talk about. We know that we are the scripture refers to us as trees. There's no doubt about that. We know that. But the question I have is, are angels also um, regarded as trees? And the answer is yes. The scripture is clear that angels are also, or messengers, um, are likened to as trees. And I've got that in Ezekiel 31. We see that, um, you know, S.A. 10, the entire chapter speaks of SA 10 as being a pharaoh who was a mighty cedar in Lebanon, right? How his height was exalted above all the other cedars. You see that? And it says, and how no other trees were like him in beauty. And so they envied him, right? At Ezekiel, Ezekiel 17, it says that also same thing. Um, it's speaking about a parable, cedars of Lebanon, and same thing with Isaiah 14, 8. You know, indeed, the cypress, cypress trees rejoice over you. And it's talking about, um, as you s remember, the account of, of uh, Lucifer, right, or Hillel. So the trees in the garden, why am I singling out the trees a little bit? Let me just go back and highlight something to you that you've, I don't know if you've noticed that before. Um, in the... Uh, when the Garden of Eden was being uh, featured now in this story, you're going to notice something here that is interesting. In Genesis 2, 4, okay, the latter part of that verse, because it starts off by saying, this is the history of the heavens and the earth when they were created. And of course, that's talking about the Genesis chapter 1. It's almost like it should belong Everything up until that point should be a part of chapter one. But as we know, right, chapter divisions and stuff like that is man-made. Um, but there's a couple of uh, verse uh, translation that gets this a little bit correctly. I'll show you. I think it's ASV. So if you go to ASV, you're going to see. No, it's not ASV. It is, I think it's, um, I think it's YLT. Okay, so. Um, oh, sorry, which one was it again? I think it was NLT. Maybe it's NLT. But in, okay, here we go. So in the New Living Translation, the same verse in Genesis chapter 2, the, this is the account of the creation of the heavens and the earth, period. When Yahweh made the earth and heavens. You see how it's sort of a brand new sentence? So what I'm trying to say is, in, in, and it's going to go back to New King James because it's what I'm most familiar with. It's almost like 
you got to imagine that that's a, a finished sentence. It's like a period, and then this is a brand new sentence. So in the day that Yahuwah Elohim made the earth and the heavens. So in the day. And so what's the biggest difference now? Um, the name of Yahuwah is revealed here, right? Prior to, in Genesis chapter 1, it only refers to the plural Elohim. But in the day that Yahuwah Elohim made the earth and the heavens, it's like you got to see that as a brand new chapter, right? And then all of a sudden, the name of Yahuwah is introduced, and there's a shift in order. So now, prior to, it says this is the history of the heavens and earth. But now, there's a shift. In the day that Yahuwah Elohim made the earth and the heavens, so it's almost like the focal point is the earth all of a sudden. But it says before any plant of the field was in the earth. This is before, and before any herb of the field had grown. So we know if you go back to Genesis 1, that, let's go back to Genesis 1, you're going to see that on day 2 was when the dry land earth was came up, right? And the, the separation of earth and seas was happening. And then you know that on day 3 was when, the earth let the earth bring forth grass and herb that yields seed and the fruit tree that yields fruit so the what i'm saying is day three was when the the herbs the grass and the trees were made right um and in genesis 2 just before the garden story is being featured here, um, the scripture is saying before any of those were created, before any of the herb had grown, right? And it, it speaks and it tells us Yahuwah Elohim had not caused it to rain on the earth and there was no man to till the ground, but there was a mist that nasa, that that. Allah, I should say, that ascended from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. So why is there no rain? Because on day four was when the sun was made. And as we know, um, rain is a result of the cycle of the sun that takes place when it comes to, um, you know, evaporation, con condensation, precipitation, whatever the order is, right? So I guess what I'm trying to say to you is you got to pay attention to the details. It seems as if there's a shift in focus and it's taking us back to day three, right? Before the plant, the herb, all that stuff was created. Before there was sun, because there was no rain. But yet there is this mist or think of a clouds, like, you know, mist. When you think of um, uh, mist, picture a, a mountain. Right. So it looks like clouds surrounding the mountain. So it looks like. So what I'm saying is the Garden of Eden is on higher ground. So what I'm saying is this is not the same creation that's taking place in day six. So day six was when um, the beast was made and then man was made. You're going to notice in the story of Adam and Eve, Adam was made first and then the beast. Right. In day six, people, you're going to notice that and, you know, study this for yourself. On day six, you're going to notice that when man was made, they were made male and female. Right here, there is man first, beast, and then the woman comes out of him. So there's there's the difference is what I'm trying to say that you can't just sort of brush it under the carpet because that's the traditional view of how the creation story has come about, right? So, so why am I pointing that out? I'm pointing that out because another difference in the Garden of Eden is that there's no reference to plants and herbs here in this account. The next time you're gonna see that is when they were kicked out of the garden. So what I'm saying is that, I'm not saying that there isn't plants or herbs, but this what's written here um, Yahuwah is highlighting certain things for us. So in the garden, there's only reference to trees. And what I'm saying is both 
um, the scripture both refers to man and angels as trees. So I just want us to put that in the forefront of our mind, right? So, and then we talked about how earlier um, I, I asked a question, how many trees are in the garden, in the middle? Let me, let me rephrase that. How many trees are in the center of the garden? So if you were to look at a dartboard, right? A dartboard only has one red in the middle. Okay, and so the traditional view is that there are two trees, right? But we have to wonder why, if you look further uh, to the end of the book in Revelation 20, 22, you're going to notice that there's no tree of knowledge of good and evil mentioned there. But here there is, right? So, and then also, we read, we looked at the Hebrew. If you look at the Hebrew, um, it doesn't really have the word and the, right? It's talking about the, the tree, the etz, in the center of Eden, right? And then the tree of knowledge of good and evil. But then we know that that is for training purposes. So is it possible that there, Yahuwah is trying to teach Eve something out of that branch that she's seeing. Okay, because because so what do I mean? If you go to Genesis three, this is the dialogue between the 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 shining one, the the um, what's the word Nahash, right? The Nahash, who by the way is the mo more cunning than any beast of the field. That is another interesting phrase that we have to study further. But if you think that the serpent is a like like a snake here, I think we have to re-look at that understanding when we get there, right? But um, but what I wanted to point out when they're having a, a dialogue, um, you have to see that from Eve's point of view, right? Like, so first of all, let's let's look at the dialogue briefly here. So the serpent was saying, and he said to the woman, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden, right? Again, that's English. And in the English, it makes it look like there's a question mark, as if, as if he paused and is waiting for Eve to respond. So if, if you look at the Hebrew, it's actually quite different. And we'll break this down another time. But basically what the serpent was just saying was, so, you know, so God said not to eat from the tree. And he kept, in the Hebrew, there's no question mark. And it's as if he's, he kept talking, right? He's just having a dialogue. So what? And then he kept just dialoguing with the woman. And when the woman responded to the serpent, it's as if she interrupted him. So there's really no question mark in the Hebrew, is my point. And the, it's, the serpent just kept on talking, and the woman interrupted him. And she gave, she expressed, she verbalized something here that's interesting. We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the, the, but of the fruit of the tree, which is in the middle or on the center of the garden, Yahweh said not to eat, because you shall die, right? So if you look at what she's saying and ponder it for a second, and, and we know that that is eventually, it, the scripture will say that that is referring to the good and evil, right? Because that's what the serpent was saying. You know what? You're, you're not. Oh, and here's the other thing. You will not surely die. In the Hebrew, again, it doesn't really say, he's not really contradicting what the woman is saying. Because in the Hebrew, He's just repeating what the woman said. So you see how you shall not truly die is in the English, but in Hebrew, it's mut mut. So in other words, it's like die, die. And, and we've seen the scripture already. I don't know if you remember, but we've talked about perfect peace, shalom, shalom. There's always this repetition. So really, there is, um, when, when, 
when Yahuwah gave the commandment to Adam and he says you, you're to eat of all the trees except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, right? Um, because in the day, again, in the day that you eat of it, you shall moot moot or die die. So there's the mention of death is twice, and that's interesting again. So just keep just remember that, I guess, for future reference. But as you can see, the serpent wasn't really saying, You're not gonna die. The serpent was confirming what Yahuwah was saying as consequence. Nahash Amar Isha Mut Mut, right? So just this is, I guess what I'm saying is very different than how we have to see it from a, a, a layer of understanding in a sense. And, and I'm not, and the reason why we're doing this is, again, because keep in the back of your mind that this is going to help us, put us in a better place of understanding who we are, what we're made up of, and what are some of the weaknesses that we have, how, what, what should we guard ourselves against. Right. So. But of the fruit of the tree, again, from Eve's from the woman's point of view, she's she's referring to the tree, which is in the center of the garden. But from her point of view, the tree of life isn't mentioned. So my point is, is she only seeing a part of the tree? Is my point is she only seeing a part of it not the full picture because um and this is not just my I, i've done some research and some some uh you know like hebraic uh, like sages and stuff like that what they they perceive is that the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is a ve is veiling the tree of life so it's a veil right so now, if you look at um, somewhere in in the in the in the New Testament, I think it's in Hebrews. You know how there is a veil that torn when um, when Yahusha, um, you know, died on the tree, right? There's a veil that torn, and in Hebrews, I believe it says, "And that veil was the flesh of Yahusha." So we have to see that. Hmm, and, and remember, we talked about last time how when the woman came out of Adam, there was something that Adam passed down to her, you know, because it says there that Adam was Tardama, was Yahuwah caused Adam to die a violent death or to reach a level of unconsciousness. And so when that unconscious, um, out of that unconsciousness, Eve came out, right? So Eve came out of that. And then the scripture says, this is now flesh of my flesh, bone of my bone. So it's almost like the unconscious was, was manifest in the person of Eve, okay? Um, you know, I don't know why. Can you excuse me? I think someone's at the door. I'll be back real quick. Yeah. All right. Sorry, sorry. Okay. <laughs> so, okay. So, where I'm coming from is that um, from Eve's point of view, she her viewpoint of the tree is is, lim is limiting her, and part of the reason for that is Kiyahua is um is teaching her is testing her i should say okay so that's sort of the narrative of of the garden story where i'm going to be coming from so now i want to now take us a little bit more to a level where we can understand it personally right um so remember that uh adam is a type of spirit of our spirit and eve is a type of our soul and in the garden we know that the commandment of yahuwah was given to adam right and that was before eve came out of the picture and then eve was taken out of adam and so it, there's really no reference in the scripture that eve was ever face to face with yahuwah 
the panim to panim experience happened when he breathed the breath of life into the man. And yeah, you can argue, you can say that, well, Eve was in him. So yeah, okay, fine. So Eve was inside Adam, or the soul is in the spirit, right? So we are spirit beings in possession of a soul, and we manifest that in a body, right? Um, but Psalms 19.7 says the, the law of Yahuwah is perfect, and it is for the converting of the soul. So Adam, or our spirit man, Paul says that I delight in the law of Yahuwah in my inner man, but I'm looking at you know, but I see another law in the in the in the flesh, like a, a member of my flesh. He's talking about there's another law of sin in the members of his flesh, and so there's this battle, right? But there's a spirit. The spirit delights in the law of Yahuwah. In fact, the spirit is from Yahuwah. So if Yahuwah is all knowing, in a sense. I mean, not in a sense, but if Yahuwah is all-knowing, all-powerful, and, you know, there's a piece of that in us because he loaned us his spirit to us. So what is that? That's the breath of Yahuwah loaned to us. So there's a part of us that already knows. But then there's a part of us, a soul, that needs converting, right? So now do you see the, you know, the, 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 the how how the serve and return is working right sort of like the from as far as from a child development being yahuwah nurturing them and preparing them to be wise you know to be a, to to carry the testimony of yahuwah right when they go out okay so um okay so now i want to where am i going to take this for a second let me think um okay so when i talk about seeing a part of the tree um i'm going to show you oh, hold on. is it possible that the tree of life and, and and we liken that to the menorah right and so the tree of life is there but then a part of it is only revealed to Eve. Okay, so let me let me first explain why I'm using the menorah um, as an example of the tree of life. Okay, so in Isaiah uh, 11, 1, right? There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. So we know that the vine is Yahuwah. That's the spirit of Yahuwah, right? And there's there are branches that will grow out of his roots, right? And you can see there's a specific order, right? And what I did was I started from the outer branches. So there's an order. So the Ruach of Yahuwah shall rest upon him. And we know that's Yahusha. What is it? The Ruach of Wisdom. And understanding, sorry, backtrack a little bit. I started from the inner branch, okay? So the Ruach of wisdom and understanding. So wisdom and understanding is nearest to the divine, okay? Um, and then the Ruach of counsel and might, okay? And you can see how they're, they're sharing the same branch in a sense. So wisdom, so the beginning, um, when, when you achieve wisdom, that understanding comes with it. So if you achieve understanding, wisdom comes with it. Sort of, it's, it's that sort of, you know, it, that's how um, connected they are. They're, they're one and the same, but, but it's almost like a process that you have to achieve one first. I don't know if you know what I'm trying to say, but let me move forward and I'll see if I can. Um, um, explain a little bit further. So counsel and might, and then the ruach of knowledge and reverence of Yahuwah, right? So when we talked about how the tree in the center of the garden is being used as a modality of learning, right? So, and the scripture calls it the knowledge of good and evil, 
right? Somewhere, um, I don't know if I recorded it, but there's a verse that says, um, that talks about how the testing of, I think it's here. Um, it, it's talking about how, um, oh yeah, perfect love casts out fear. And then there's also talking about how, oh, here we go, Exodus 2020. 20, and Moshe said to the people, do not fear for Yah has come to test you and that his fear may be before you so that you may not sin. So what I'm trying to say is from Eve's perspective, remember she has been taught the commandment by Adam. You know, so Yahuwah gave the commandment to Adam, to our, Yahuwah gave the commandment to our spirit because our spirit man delights in his commandment. But then there's a part of us now that needs to be converted. So now Adam is teaching our soul or, or Eve the commandments of Yahuwah to convert her, right? To bring her to oneness with Yahuwah. So there's a part of us that is not quite one with Yahuwah until we pass certain things, certain tests. And what is that based out of um, when we are being tested? That is obedience. So Yahuwah wants to see if you're going to obey him because we're not made robots. So our soul or the woman represents free will, right? So Adam, you can argue, you know, he's, you know, how Adam is spirit. Like can, can our spirit, um, if our spirit man disobeys, I'm oh, sorry, no. Hold on, let me say this. In in um in Ecclesiastes somewhere it says when a man, when a person dies, the dust goes back to the ground and the spirit goes back to the one who made it. So disobedience is something to do with free will. So if you think about it, if Yahuwah is loaning his spirit to us, our spirit can't really rebel if you think about it. Right? So the power is in the air, but it's in the blowing. So Whoever is harnessing that, harnessing the power from the air can direct it elsewhere is the point. So my point is Eve represents free will. So Yahuwah is training our soul so that we can prove to him that we have reverence for him by obeying him, right? Um, so not a, not a question. So yeah. for, uh, cause, uh, so the word, you said that the word death is uh, moot, you said, if, if I heard that correct? Um, yes. Or it, to it, die? Yeah, well, I'm looking at, okay, let's go back to the commandment. Mm -hmm. Yahweh says, okay, here, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat for in the day you eat of it, you shall that's in the English, right? It says, you shall surely die. So here, you know, the, the word, well, the word moot, I, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, moot. You see that? It, it, it appears twice in that English text. You see that? Yeah, okay, cool. And it's M U. WTH and and I wish I can I think that's mem uh is that yeah one? it it's, it would it sounds like it would be mem wa ta huh. because uh because the thing is like I know that for certain um words like some people will just like instead of doing like the the um the the th that pronounces like the you know they'll just uh, end it with a t. So I was I was wondering that because I wanted to um, see if I could actually break that down, mm -hmm. and um, because because we know that mem mem is chaos, right? Um, it's also mighty. It's also like the stream, and it's also uh, rep a representative of the deep. And then wa is um, the um, it is the peg. It is the nail. It's the hook if i'm remembering correctly i'm going off the top of my head i'm actually going to go down to the um 
down to the pictures. And the reason why um, I was asking about that is, um, you know, the 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 way that um, death is understood, and the fact that there is a double portion yes. to the word. Yes. I feel like is a um, is is noteworthy because oh, yes. um, wherever there's a double portion of something, that also means that there's like an emphasis on it. You know, just like how um, it, it, it's somewhat almost of a slang type, where like you know, if someone were to say like, "Oh, you're not gonna like die, die," but you know, like how like we just go off on that, but. In in Hebraics, there's a different like understanding and value to it. So mm -hmm. it's like it makes me it makes me wonder, um, you know, what that has to do with the tree of life, and then makes me want to like, you know, um, take a look at the the polar opposites or even the similarities between the understanding of life, the understanding of death, um, and then how knowledge kind of like is in the um in the midst of that you know so yeah i'm gonna um actually i'm gonna look that up